How many hunger for God's word this morning? Are you hungry? I got now I got a word here. I got a word here. We're going to be talking about some things over the course of the next couple couple months. I'm really, really excited about this. Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 9, very familiar passages of Scripture. Some time ago, the Lord began to speak to me, and I, and I shared it a little bit. I even prophesied a little bit about it, We that persecution, there's going to be some unusual persecution that is going to hit churches, and we have to be... Um, mindful of this really understand what the enemy is seeking to do and one of the things that God spoke to me about was preparing an army prepare an army prepare an army and so you're going to see me kind of talk a little bit about this but and this so this is the title of my message this morning preparing an army Joshua chapter one is very important because we see here with Joshua um, transition taking place. Moses has served his people faithfully and has done a valiant job. And as he's gone through this process with the people of God, he has had to deal with not only um, pressures from without, but most importantly, his issues were with pressure from within. He had to deal with pressures that were that came from within and as a result of it there was a detoxing from the from Egypt that Moses had to lead the people of God through so that they can come through on the other side and experience all the blessing and benefit of 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 really just walking with God and so now in Joshua chapter 1 we see there's a transition taking place because Moses has died and now God has raised up uh, he has raised up Joshua. And in verse 1 through 9, we see some cri critical principles here that we need for anybody that is going to be a part of the body of Christ and who is going to be a part of God's army. These characteristics are characteristics that we want to embody because as the world is getting darker and darker, our light is going to shine. Well, the devil doesn't like you to shine. He wants us to be in darkness like himself. So what, so what we have to do is realize that there is opposition, but do we have the character qualities that God is looking for so that we can push back and really become the army of the Lord? So it says here, in verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that Moses spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, uh, he says, and to the great sea toward the going down from the sun shall be your territory. Just underline that, territory. It says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Now, this is critical, y'all. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Then he says this to him. God says, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Then he says it again, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. How many want to prosper wherever you go? He said you may prosper wherever you go. 
Look at verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, somebody say then, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid. Look at your neighbor and tell him, do not be afraid. He says, nor dismayed. Tell him, nor dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Somebody say wherever. God, we just thank you. We thank you. So when we look here, we see that as God is preparing this new man and has been preparing this new man, now the transition is taking place, we see God giving him specific instructions. He's encouraging him. He's strengthening him. He's getting his heart right. He's getting his posture right. He's pushing him into a position of uh, preeminence within the nation, and he's helping him to see that you're taking their, them in. The manna is going to cease. The manna is going to cease. Now you have to take up your swords and you have to fight. You have to fight. And I think that what's happened for us in Christianity is sometimes, and, and I, some, some, some of this could be bad teaching, but some of it is just our perspective. We don't understand that the church, and you hear me say this all the time, being a part of a church is not being a part of a cruise ship. The church is not a cruise ship. The church is a battleship. Just read the book of Acts. It's a battleship. It's a battleship. Now, there is, there is a wing on the ship for healing, for deliverance, for all those things. We, there's a place for that on this battleship, and this is, part of, this is part of what we do here at the church. It's a part of our vision that God has given me for the church. But what happens is we can't, we can't but think that it's just all supposed to be a cruise ship or all supposed to just be, you know, a hospital. The church is not just a hospital for sinners. It is a training and equipping place for the saints. So that we get prepared, we get healed, we, get, we, get, we have God restore in our lives, and then we get back out into the community, even though we're not of the world, we're in the world having an impact on the world for the glory of God. Can I have an amen? This is what we have to see that it's not a cruise ship. That, that here, we're, God has raised us up, saved us, and given us an opportunity to go out here and have a massive impact and help to change people's lives by the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. He's making this transition now. Joshua is making this transition now with God. And he specifically says here, and we'll look at verses 1 and 2, and after Moses' The servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Transition. Transition. There is a mindset that now is shifting. And also... Those things which he had learned from Moses as he observed, now it's time for him to put it into practice. It's time for him to put it into practice. It's a shame that when it comes to Christianity, we think that we're approved just by what we know. We're approved just by what we know. But there is a place for application that we have to start to really focus on as we're going forth and we're approaching the end of the age. It's not just what I know, it's also what I apply to my own life. Application is so important. 
So it's, it's not just, so now he's learned from Moses. Now it's time to put into practice those principles that have been deposited within his life because now he's going to be the leader and Moses is dead. The transition is taking place. Now it's time for him to make the shift in his own heart and understand that it's time for you now to take this people over the Jordan and to go in and to possess the land. Well, this is, this is sometimes it's tough because it's easy to sit back and say, well, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I know they said this, but I know, but you know, I, I just really believe this. And no, 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 no. When, when, when my coach called, I write 37 power. I understood the concept of I write 37 power, who was going to block who and all these other things. But then now that I've got the information, when he calls the play, I got to run the play. I got to apply that. Or else I'm going to be sitting on the sidelines. And even worse, I could get fired. Well, in Christianity, it's, the, the, it's simple. If we simplify it, God said, he says this, he says this, he says this. Now, I need to apply. I can't just know. I don't want the book just to be here. I want the book to be here. Can I have an amen? I want to be a living epistle read of all men. We want to be living epistles. So now application, now you've learned from Moses. Now it's time for you to take these individuals into their promised land and into the purpose of God because Moses is dead. Moses can't do it for you, Joshua. Moses isn't here to hold your hand. We have to start asking ourselves, how many accountability partners do I need? At the end of the day, when I'm at my computer, my, my accountability partner can't ha- help me. I have to be able to apply the principles of God and pl- click the X when I need to click the X. Can I have an amen? That I, I can't get involved in that. I can't be watching that stuff. I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I'm applying the principles of God to help me stay in a sanctified position. Here, Moses is dead. He has to raise up. He has to march in. And when it comes to being an army, there's no way we can be a successful army if we don't take instructions. And so this transition is taking place. But then look at verses 3 and 4, and this is important. He says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from this wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Excuse me, I like this because what happens with this is, is we have to see that just like in the natural, we may possess territory. We have g- ground that has been given, land has been given, something has been passed down in the natural. The problem with us sometimes as Christians and as the church, we don't really, really grasp the concept that there is territory in the spirit that God has grant. Ooh, I just feel an anointing on this. That our that our fight is not a natural fight; it is a spiritual fight. And we're going to see this when we turn to Ephesians chapter six. But we're fighting against principalities and powers and the wicked rulers of the darkness of this age, a spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. And what's happening is, is whether you realize it or not, when we come into regions, when you come into a city, you're coming into a territory that the devil has occupied for himself. And those spirits that are ruling in that particular region, he wants those spirits to get into your life. Well, what happens for us as a church community, when a church is planted in the region, the church helps to push back the forces of darkness. 
and bring light in the midst of the darkness so that people that are seeking to change their life, they can, they can get, be, become brought, well, they, can, they, they get brought into the kingdom of God through the church. And as a result of it, they begin to see things from a different vantage point. I can mention certain cities. I can mention certain territories. And, you, and as soon as I mention them, a certain characteristic will come over your mind. All I got to do is, because this is what the devil is doing in that region. Well, for us, our desire and our design as a church is to push back the powers of darkness and become a source of light for people to come in. Because wherever the soles of our foot shall tread, God has given it to us. But do we really see that as a church? Do we understand that you're in a region to help push back darkness? To rebuke spirits of lust, pornography, witchcraft. To come forth and help people to find their true identity in Christ instead of finding it in people's wicked imaginations concerning who they think people are and the deception of the devil. Now, let me just say something to every person. God is the one who created us. He is the one who defines us. But the, as you watch now with what we're seeing with homosexuality and transgenderism and all these other things, the devil, all he's doing is he wants to confuse people concerning their identity and rob them of the purpose for which they were created. And he wants to bring destruction in the people's lives through this deception and confusion so that people, they end up missing out on God's purpose for their life. And as a church community, when we see things like this, our desire is not to come and fight with everybody, but to give people the truth of the gospel as we speak in love, amen, and help them to see God's purpose for their life. God did not make a mistake by making you a girl. Can I have an amen? He did not make a mistake by making you a boy. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And he imagined you and dreamed you up in his mind and brought you, can I have an amen, y'all, and, and brought you forth just the way he wanted you to be. But we get around people, and because of these principalities and powers, these wicked rulers, they come along, and what do they do? They seek to bring confusion concerning people's lives. Well, our job is to help to push back with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. To bring clarity underst and understanding that we're in the region for a reason. We're not just here just to sing and have a good time. And though we do all those things, this is a blessing. Is when God gathers the saints like the heartbeat. When he gathers, then he scatters. He gathers, then he scatters. We gather on Sunday morning, we get equipped, we get trained, we let God deal with us, we let God bless us, we get strengthened, we get rejuvenated, we get revived, we get awakened, we get refreshed, we go through the whole process. Then we go back out into the streets and we say, God, who can you use me to speak to, to minister to, to help to come out of darkness because I'm in this region for a reason, I'm on this job for a reason. I'm on this block for this reason. I'm on this, in this community for a reason. I'm walking these streets for a reason. And wherever the soles of my foot shall tread, that God, you've given it to me. This spiritually, in the spirit, when I come into a region, I'm bringing the power that rests upon me. I'm not afraid to go to San Francisco. I'm not afraid to go in these regions. Why? Because when I go there, the kingdom of God is coming with me wherever I go. And can I have an amen, y'all? You see what I'm saying? This is what happens. We start to get stirred up in our spirit realizing that God is with me. The kingdom of God is with me. Well, the church, unfortunately, we have, we have bought into this idea 
that, well, we just stay within our comfortable group and, and we'll be fine and nobody messes with me and I won't mess with them. Well, well, I get what you're saying, but there is, but the warrior in you and I has to come out. I am, I do, I, I am concerned about my family. I want everybody in my family to be saved. I want them to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want them to walk with Jesus. I want them to know Jesus. I want them to fall in love with Jesus. I don't want the devil to have any place in their life. Now, they have to make a decision. They have to make a decision. But my desire for them will never change. I want them to know all the fullness of who Jesus is. I want my coworkers, when I get them around them, I want them to feel a little fidgety. Yeah, I'm saved. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm after you, but we're going to get rid of them demons that's in your life. And they're the ones that's making you real fidgety. They don't want you around me. Them demons don't want you around me because they, they know I'm bringing the kingdom. Get him out of here. We got to get him out of here. We got to get Kaufman out of here. Get him out of here because, you know, he's trying, he's trying, to, he's trying to stop him from, from smoking weed. He's trying to stop him from drinking. He's, he's trying to stop him from fornicating, from lying and cussing. And he's trying to stop him from, from, from having hatred in their heart and bitterness and unforgiveness. He's trying to stop him. We got to get him out of here. We got we to gotta lie on him. We got to say something. Do something. He's trying to minister to too many people, and they're, they're, they're listening to him. Come on, do something. We got to do something, demons. Demons, y'all can't do nothing. Shut up. God's about to save these people and get them free, filled with the Holy Ghost, and the power of God's going to come upon their life. Their, their marriage is going to re get restored. Their body's going to get healed. Can I have an amen? God's bringing them out of darkness. We got to see that this is the reality of what you're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. You can label it mental health. You can label it all this stuff. You can label it whatever you want. I'm telling you, when you come into a region, the devil wants to try to make you go crazy. And you got to tell the devil, I will not go crazy. I will walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus and continue to bring. And I'm bringing the power of God. And when Joshua comes on the scene, this is the mindset that God is forging. Go in there and fight and take all the land. I've already given it to you. They're going to try to resist you. They're going to try to stop you. But you keep walking through that land and watch what I will do. This is what God is doing with him. The manna is ceased, has ceased. Now it's time to pick up the sword and fight. Can I have an amen, y'all? And so he says in verse 3, and then he said and in verse 4, he says, shall be your territory. Look at verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Div divine assistance. Just write it down. Divine assistance. As God is preparing this army, he's getting the leader's mind right. And then he's helping him to see that what you're doing, you're not doing it alone. Well, oftentimes this is where the devil gets us because we think that our circumstances are the only sign that God is really with us or not. But realize, don't let your circumstances deceive you. Don't let your circumstances deceive you. Understand that God was with Daniel in the lion's den. Understand that when David fought against Goliath, God was with him. Never forget that when Jesus was carrying his cross and he was on the cross, we, we have to see that when it comes to all these, all these things, that when we're, well, there's going to be times when our circumstance can deceive us if we really don't know God. God was with Moses when Moses went before Pharaoh. God was with Moses when Moses was standing at the Red Sea. 
God was with Moses when they went through the Red Sea onto dry land and they get out there and then the people are crying for food and everything. And God was with him every single step of the way. And sometimes our circumstance may seem like, man, what is going on? And we can start to think that, man, is God, where is God at? Never forget that God is with you. Can I have an amen, y'all? If you align yourself with God, God is with you. And don't allow your circumstances to deceive you. God was with the Apostle Paul as he sat right there in prison. And he, he penned these epistles. God was with him. God was near him. He said, and all have forsaken me, but the Lord stood with me. God will stand with you. But the question is, are you standing with him? Are you standing with him? When, it, when, when you do experience persecution because of your relationship with Jesus, do you continue to stand with Jesus? When your family members don't invite you to the Christmas party, do you still stand with Jesus? When your children start flipping out on you because you're telling them that, that, that no, I did not push out a boy. I pushed out a girl. And you may not like what I'm saying to you. I love you, but you cannot convince me that you're someone that God, I know, did not release through me. Can I have an amen? Now, you may not like me and you don't want to hang out with me. I understand. Are you going to stand with Jesus and say, you know, I, I love you, but I just, I cannot agree with that. But I love you. Do we, are we willing to look at our, at our spouses in the eye and say the tough thing when they just want to go fishing all the time on Sunday when you used to go to church? Oh, I know I'm preaching right now. You used to go to church, but now we're just going to go fishing. But we used to go to church. That's how, we, that's how our marriage was staying together. That's how we came together. That's how we got to, we, it was about Jesus. It was about the church. And now, well, now, we, now we, we get a little money and we got a little, and now we can't go to church anymore? Are you willing to stand up and say, no, I, you know, I got to go to church. Me being a part of the church is not a matter of just convenience. It is a matter of survival. Can I have an amen? I know who I used to be. And I don't want to be him anymore. I need to be in the presence of God at all times. And I need to get around the saints and give God some praise. Can I have an amen, y'all? Well, this is, this is the warfare that we have to start learning how to fight. This is the warfare. This is the warfare. And what ends up happening here is we see... We see that if we stand with God, he stands with us. And so here, God tells him that basically you're going to have divine assistance. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be right there. The question is, do we leave him? Joshua never left him. Look what it says in verse 6. It says, be strong and of good courage for this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them said in verse 7 only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you to do he says do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go I like this. He says be strong. This particular Hebrew word, it means to be strong, to strengthen, to be courageous. It means to overpower. Now, we want to, from a spiritual standpoint, understand that, that God strengthens us with might and with his power in our inner man, our inner man, your inner man becomes strong inwardly. 
you become a fortress for righteousness and for the things of God. There is a, there's a place where we get strong within. It's not just about being strong without. You can go to the 24-hour fitness as much as you want and become the biggest, strongest person that could be strong. But let me tell you, that is not true strength and the strength that you're going to need to survive against the onslaught of the devil. Can I have an amen? You got to have some inner fortitude, some strength within. So when the devil comes to try to tempt you like he used to do, you have the strength within you to say no and to resist the devil that he might flee from you. Well, the enemy, he wants to bring pressure. You bring pressure. You bring pressure. What happens is God tells him to be strong. He didn't say, I'm going to make you strong. He didn't say, I'm going to make you strong. He says, be strong. He's telling them, what you have, exercise it and use it. Use the strength. There's a fortitude that, that, that God gives us in and through Christ we have to start turning in, uh, tapping into. The power to tell yourself no when you need to tell yourself no. Can I have an amen, y'all? The, the, the willingness to stand flat-footed against opposition and not be moved and have your face set like a flint towards Jerusalem, Jesus. He knew what his assignment was, and so he had his face set like a flint towards Jerusalem. He, he locked in, and, and he couldn't, he couldn't there, nothing anybody could do to stop Jesus from going to the cross. It was just, he was going to do it. Well, this is what happens with us. We got to get this in our spirits and learn the value of being strong, being individuals that are willing to be courageous and then allow the power to God, power of God to come upon us. Then we begin to overpower situations from the inside out within our own hearts. And that means sometimes doing things the unconventional way. That may mean that, hey, for you in your life, there's certain things you shouldn't even be involved in. I, you know what? I know the old me. I can't go over on that block. I can't, I can't get involved in all that. I'm not doing that. Or at least not right now. At least not right now. You know what? Uh, uh, you know what? Him, I got to delete his number. He got to go. I can't even talk to him. Her, I just, you know, she cute, she cute, she got to go. She got to go, she got to go. Can I have an amen? I can't, I can't go to the party with y'all, man, I can't do it. I can't do it. Man, you used to be the life of the party, man. Man, when you used to do the cabbage patch, everybody was flowing, man. Everybody was flowing. Come on, y'all know y'all was doing the cabbage patch up in there. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> you ready? Man, your running man was off the hook, man. You used to do that running man, man. You used to have the Michael Jackson jacket on everything, man. Y'all know that Michael Jackson jacket with the zippers and everything like that, huh? <laughs> I can't get around. I can't go, bruh. I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I can't do it. I can't go with y'all, man. It ain't happening no more. So don't ask me. Don't ask me to go. It's not happening. It's not happening. Well, there's times where you have to take those drastic measures, and that is a sign of true strength. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of, I know me, and I'm not playing around with the old me, and I can't, I, you know what, I don't want anything to do with none of that. I can't go, man. I'm not going. And generally, what will happen is you'll see uh, over time, when you are strong and you stand in a place in a position of strength that comes from God that has been allowed to hit your soul. I'll say it like this. It's been allowed to hit your soul and spirit. Then what ends up happening is people look and they start to respect you for that. 
Hey, they respect you. Oh, man, I respect that brother. You know what? He really, he really is serious. He's not playing. I tried to test him, tried to trick him, tried to get him to do it. He, people will respect you for that. He says, be strong, and he says, and of good courage. Somebody say courage. A verb meaning to be strong, determined. Determined. Bold. Courageous. This word here means conqueror. He's telling them to be bold, to be strong, to be courageous, to act like a conqueror. You're going into this land, and I'm not going to fight for you. You got to pick up your sword, and you got to fight the Jebusites and the Hittites. And I've given you this land. And God says the same thing to us step up. Begin to preach the gospel and give people the word of God and love on people and help them to see that there's hope in Jesus. Get out in the street. Don't just get in the church and stay in the church. Get out here and let me use you for the glory of God and take territory, take land, take the position, take regions, take cities and, and bring the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and let the power of God be released in the region. The churches, that's why churches exist. To come in and to do battle and to help, to help people get out of their old way of thinking and into the knowledge of God. He says it means to be strong and courageous. The idea is translated by the King James Version, the new King James Version, as prevailed when referring to men in, of Judah in war, when referring to men of Judah in war, it means prevailed, prevailed, to prevail. Be courageous. Go forth and prevail. Well, what happens for a lot of individuals, and it's unfortunate even for the churches, the devil puts enough pressure on people, people will shut down, clam up, and they will stop progress, and they will allow themselves to be overtaken by fear. And we're going to talk about this as we go down. They're overtaken by fear. I don't want them. I, don't, I want everybody to like me. I don't want to lose my friends. I want to make sure we stay connected. I don't want them to feel uncomfortable. Sometimes God will offend your mind to get to your heart. He will offend your mind to get to your heart. And he has no problem doing that. When he goes on the scene, he, he talks to the Pharisees. He says, you guys are whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. The woman brings her, her daughter to be healed. And he said, it's not me to give the children's bread to the dogs. She didn't get offended. She said, even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the children's table. She didn't let herself get offended. Some people get offended. Pastor Coffin said this and at service, and he was saying this, you know, and, 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 and the people, they, they won't say that they're offended. They're offended. They just got offended. But all I was doing is saying something that's right out of this book, and the people get offended, and then they miss out, they miss out on what God was trying to give. But the woman, she said, oh, you can call me whatever you want. Just give me them crumbs. I want that bread. You, I don't call, you just give me the bread and bring healing. Bring healing to my daughter. I don't care what you say. Just bring healing. You can call me a dog, a cat, a rat, a mouse. Just heal my daughter, and we're going to be all right, all right? She knew what to do. People come, they get offended. How dare they say this? That, how dare he say that? Well, listen, I'm going to say it, and you can get mad. And I tell you all all the time, there's a bunch of great churches around here. And you are blessed to go there, but I am not. I'm going to say what Jesus says in this book. I'm going to do it without apology, and that it just is what it is. And if I got to preach to the pole, I'll preach to the pole, and I will. That pole is going to get saved in the name of Jesus. I don't care. But I'm. A, can I have an amen, y'all? We don't get offended. But what happens to all of us? We have to see that when it comes to us walking with God. We, we prevail and we allow ourselves to enter a place where people may not always like what you have to say, but you're willing to say it and stand with him because you know that it's the truth. But the church has cowered back into a corner. 
The church wants to be friends with everybody, not realizing that the church is designed to shake things up a little bit. When Jesus gave birth to the church and the church went forth on the day of Pentecost and we see them going forth, in that region there was a lot of upheaval and questions and people were concerned about the way. And it's because they came on the scene and they were not passive. They were truly apostolic and they were breaking through barriers to bring the gospel and the whole region was shaken up. And you see the same thing with the apostle Paul. When he went into the regions, he came there and, and people heard about that guy. He's, he's shaking everything up. We got to stop them. We got to stop the momentum. We got to persecute him. We got to, maybe he will stop, but Paul would never stop. Because he did not consider his life dear to himself. That he might save and see people get saved through the gospel. He was willing to take those steps. Even if it meant him ending up in prison for the gospel. He goes down and he says here in verse 6. He says, be strong and courageous. So we looked at the word courage. And then it says... For to this people I, you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. We talked about that. The, not just the natural, but the spiritual aspect of that. He says, only be strong and very courageous. Now watch this. Only be strong and very courageous that you may, pros, may, may observe to do According to all the law which, my, which Moses, my servant, commanded you, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Now, when I read this, this is amazing to me because I had never, I mean, I've seen it before, but every time I read it, it just really just blesses me. He says, be strong and courageous that you may observe to do. Be strong and, and courageous that you, may, uh, that you may observe to do that all that's written in the law. And so understand, saints, that to be obedient to God and to obey his word, it's going to take some strength and some courage. When the world is telling you to do the exact opposite, when the world is saying, what's wrong with you? You're a religious fanatic. You're crazy. It doesn't take all that. It takes strength and courage to stand in that position and say, no, this is what the Bible says. I'm willing to do what the word of God says, regardless of what the culture is doing. So he said it takes strength and it takes courage to observe to do all that the law is saying to do, what God is saying to do in his word, it takes strength and courage. And there's going to be times for the church where it seems as though you are all alone. But you're not alone. And, and you're going to feel that feeling like, man, I'm just here by myself. I wish God, I wish, man, I don't have any friends. Well, maybe I just, be, and, and part of the reason why that is happening is because you have been strong and courageous to obey God when people are trying to pull you out into the world. It takes strength to do that. When I watch, when I look at people really walking with God and really serving God, that person is very courageous. Because right now, especially with social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all these TikTok, people are so, even more so now, people are so interconnected. You can just go on their line, go on their page and see what they're doing, and they don't even know that you know that you've been on their page. Oh, they went fishing yesterday. Oh, okay, that's a good picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, they went on their honeymoon. Oh, that's good. And you don't even have to like, you don't, you don't like it, but you see it. You don't press the little heart button to let them know, I, I saw you. You can just scroll through there. Oh, yeah, oh, they doing, oh, okay, they over there. Oh, they over there. Oh, they got a new house. Okay, praise God, you know. 
But the same people, as you're scrolling through, they're the same ones that, 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 um, that they don't want nothing to do with you. They don't want to connect with you. But you can see what they're doing. And what happens is now there's this, there's this feeling sometimes, like, how come, you know, it would be nice if I just, you know, I wish I could go with them. And look at their TikTok. They dancing and doing the thing. Right? And then you sit and you got to sit there. And you got to sit there and still have courage to say, yeah, that's cool what they're doing, but I got to focus on Jesus. I got it takes strength to say, you know what, nah, I'm not going to get caught up in there. And they're trying to get me over there. I can't do it. And the devil says, hey, well, why don't you just go to one party with them? They look like they're having fun. The devil don't tell you about the hangover, though. Oh, they look like they're having fun. And it takes strength to say, you know, I'm going to stick with God. And I'm going to continue to stay firm with God. And for even for a leader like myself and the elders of this church to be able to say, it doesn't matter what all the other churches are doing. We have to focus on what Jesus is telling us to do and be faithful and be, uh, be honorable and respect God until the very end and not cave to the pressure of the world. To not make this place an event center. And show business and make this place like the movie theater and like we're going to a concert and not make this place as though we're just here and we're just all love bugs that just, you know, and, and whatever goes and, and to do all this crazy stuff. No, 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 no. We have to, we have to stick to the word of God and we're going to shout and we're going to have a good time and we're going to bless him and we're going to honor him, but we're going to stick to the script. Can I have an amen, y'all? And not get caught up in the world. Hey, Doc, how, you, how much you running over there? How many people coming to your church? I don't know. And the members of this church and the, lead, and the our, our administrative staff, no, I don't know. And I never ask. How many, how many members you got? How many? I don't know. We just got some. I don't know some. Some come, some go. We got some. I'm not tripping off all that. I'm tripping off of whoever God brings in the church that are we being consistent in giving them the word of God and is the presence of God here to bless them. Can I have an amen? But, oh, yeah, how many are how many you running? How many are you running? Why are you asking me how many members do we have in the church? That does not validate whether we are being successful or not. You can have a big church and then the presence of God isn't there and nobody's living for God. So what does it matter? We get so caught up in the numbers and so wrapped up in the numbers. And when I have to stand strong and say, I'm not buying all that stuff in the house of God. I don't really care. Don't bring that. Then what happens is in the pastors, they don't want to talk to me no more. I'm not tripping, man. I'm not tripping. Because this is not about, it's not about that. It's not about that. But what we do is we start to think we're successful because of the stuff. Instead of realizing that, you know what, I'm successful if I remain strong and courageous in the midst of the world trying to pull me down the wrong path in life and get me off while I'm still coming to church. Can I have an amen, y'all? Let's close this out. Look what he says here in verse In verse 7, he says, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the left, to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper. Hmm. Prosper. That you may prosper wherever you go. This particular Hebrew word, it means to act. Now look at this, y'all. It means to act with insight, to be prudent, 
to give insight, to teach, to prosper, to consider, to ponder, to understand, to act prudently, to act with devotion. So the primary meaning of the word is to be prudent, to be prudent, to be. So this is, this is what helps to bring forth prosperity in our life. Prosperity and being prudent, this word, they, they go together. So when you get out in the streets and you're a part, even when you're a part of the church, there's an, there's an, um, an aspect of wisdom and knowledge and pos- pondering and insight that you have that causes you in all things to prosper in life, even financially, but also with your health, with your mind, your mental health. In every aspect of your life, there's a, there's a prosperity there. Why? Because you are prudent about your business and how you go, away, go about things. This is something that has to be considered. When they walk through the land, God was going to prosper them, but they needed to be prudent in how they, how they um, used what God had placed in their hands and the wisdom that God had given them. This is how we should walk. We should not be fools. We should walk as wise, discerning the times and knowing the times. Understanding when we're having conversations with individuals and they're trying to trip us up. Understanding that every single opportunity business-wise is not a good opportunity. That we don't just chase money. Why? Because we're prosperous, we're prudent. So money doesn't, we, we, we don't chase after money. Money just follows us. Can I have an amen? How many want money to follow you? Well, when, we, when, we're, when we're prosperous or when we're prudent, then what happens, it just follows you. You're not always chasing it. It's just coming after you. Why? Because God has placed you in a position where you're prospering, and then now everything you do, it just prospers because you're prudent. You have wisdom. You're thoughtful. You think about decisions. You pray them through. You ask God's counsel. You look for God to direct you and order, and order your steps in life. You just don't wing it through life and just take chances all the time. You're saying, God, lead me here. Oh, this is a good decision. And you're always in the deliberations of God in getting revelation from him. So now when you make decisions, God just bang, bang. You find yourself prospering in the land. You're observing the Word of God, and you're allowing the Word of God to help to become a compass and a map for you so that you're able to say, ah, no, this is the road that I should go. Well, this is what happens. And for Joshua, he was going to prosper. And you see, when you read the book of Joshua, he just, they just went in. In the times in which they made bad decisions because they weren't acting prudently. And then he goes down and he says in verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you shall make your way prosperous. Getting in the word of God, being obedient to the word of God. He says, you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Then he says it here in verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, Do not be what, y'all, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is preparing an army, but the army that God is preparing cannot be afraid or dismayed. Realize that Christianity is is not a popularity contest. You hear me say it all the time. But the thing that we have to see is we have to master fear. Fears are going to come. Pressure is going to come, whether it's just pressure in your mind or pressure from family members, pressure from friends, pressure from the culture to conform to what the culture is doing. We, ha- we cannot allow fear or, be dis- or allow ourselves to be dismayed. As we feel the pressure, we learn how to push back against the pressure, realizing that God has not given you a spirit of fear. He has not 
given you a spirit of fear. And a spirit of fear will try to come upon you. We have to resist it steadfast in our faith, knowing who we are in God. So the church cannot be overtaken with fear. Number one, we have to see that he's given us power. The Greek word dunamis is inherent power and ability that God gives you that you did not have of your own self. He gives us access to strength and courage, but he also gives us power within. He makes us strong within. We have to receive that as a Christian. Believe that as a Christian. He says power, and then he says love. True agape is not this sloppy stuff that I see all around me. That's not the love of God. If you love people, you tell them the truth, you stand in the truth with them, and you speak the truth to them in love. True biblical love lays down your life for the sake of somebody else. This is what pr true biblical love does. It gives itself for the, for the sake of someone else. Love is a giver. Love is not concerned with protecting somebody's feelings. Love tells them the truth so they can be healed in their life. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what, y'all? Free. This is how you get free, because people lovingly tell you the truth about something. But some of this soulishness that I see posing as love is corrupt. Is, is, it's already corrupted the body of Christ in great measure. And God is trying to get us back into a place of true biblical agape so that we can go forward and watch him move in the way he wants us to do. But this, some of this stuff I see, I say, that's not love. It's, that's not even love. If you're just telling everybody what they want to hear, you're not loving them. If you're just making it seem like it's okay for you to do whatever you want to do while you say you made a confession to Christ, you're not loving somebody when you do that. How can, I, how, can I see, how can I see the fire burning and then one of my children is getting ready to put their hand in the fire and, and, and I don't say anything about it? I don't love them enough to, say, to put myself in front of them to block them if I have to. This is what true biblical love does. It doesn't, it doesn't condone it and give, give way to it and say, it's okay, well, we just got to love them. Well, no, that's not loving them. If you love them, speak the truth to them in love and help. That's how I got saved. I didn't get saved. I didn't get saved because somebody came along and tried to coddle me and try to make me feel good about myself and try to flatter me up into the kingdom. I got saved because somebody was bold enough that loved God enough and loved me enough to say, hey, Napoleon, you don't even look like the type of guy to be out here cussing and acting crazy like the rest of these guys. Man, don't you know God can use your life? He said, don't you know God can use your life? What are you doing? He said that to me, and, and it was, he didn't say, hey, Napoleon, you're a nice guy, and, you know, you're fast, and, you know, you're, you're a good football player, you know, buddy, and, you know, maybe we can just, you know, maybe one day you can come to church, or, you know, you, you know. he didn't say something like, I didn't, I didn't it's not, the, uh. I needed somebody to love me enough to say, hey, man, snap out of it. Can I have any? That's not even you. You, you front now here, man. You're not one of these. Come on, God got something better for your life. He got something better for your life. He got something. He wants to do something for your life. And I look up here right now, and I'm saying, Lord, I thank you that I listened to that brother. And he, and he loved me enough to tell me the truth. He loved me enough to tell me the truth. He loved me enough. Well, this is what we need. We need this kind of love to overtake the fear that sometimes we get gripped with. I don't want to say it, you know. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to make them feel bad. They may not call me anymore. He said, "Power, love," and he said, "What y'all sound." Mind. This is what he gave you. If we're going to be an, armor, uh, an army, 
We have to dispel the fear just like he had to dispel it. God, tell him, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Power, love, and then a sound mind, a, a mind that is full of great judgment, a whole sound is a whole mind. That the mind of Christ has been forged within me so that I begin to think differently than I used to think, and my, my thinking has become healed. It's been restored. And God, through his word, has helped me to make wise decisions because my mind has been renewed and restored. Through the power of the gospel. Well, he gives us a sound mind. So then now we're also, our mind isn't void of good judgment. Now we have good judgment about things. Whether it's when it comes to dealing with people or dealing with circumstances. I like that. With people or with circumstances, I know, I know how to make good decisions and how to navigate through it. Well, this is what God does. That when we allow the Spirit of God to move, He changes our thoughts and helps us to come into alignment with Him. Well, what, what, what happens is, and, and we have to see this, is that when we're going through life, we have a lot coming at us at the same time. Lord, give me a sound mind that I'm able to determine and to make great decisions and able to discern the difference between good and evil as I'm navigating through this. This is what we're looking for. And this is what God forges. As Joshua is getting ready to go into battle, this is what he's going to encounter. He's going to encounter forces coming at him, but yet and still, because he was of sound mind, we see him making good decisions along the way. There were some that he, he missed a couple, but he didn't miss much. As you watch, if you read the book of Joshua, you just see him, and they go in and conquer Take ground, take land. And this morning, I believe that God is raising up such a powerful army. It is not an army that is going to look like the show that we've seen. It's not just about having prayer meetings. It's not just about soaking in the presence. It's not just about doing, it's about getting up and living for God in the midst of a gross darkness in the midst of these streets and out allowing the Spirit of God to use us and to prosper us wherever we go, pushing back darkness. God is raising up, and it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, God is preparing an army, and if you are a Christian, you have been enlisted in a war, baby. And God is raising us up right now. I'm going to be talking about this for a little while, and I want everybody to tune in, tap in, because this army that God is preparing, it is not, it's going to be let me say it like this. You know, in certain groups, they have these the secret ops. It's not a show. They come in the scene. They kill Osama bin Laden, and then they get out the scene. They come on the scene. They have impact, and then they get off the scene. The problem is, is that everybody wants to do the work and then make a show of it. Look at me. Look what I did. Did you see what I did? I did that. You see that? You see that? You see that, dog? God is raising up people who do not care about who gets the credit. Can I have an amen? They don't have to have the bull billboard in the city. They don't have to be, they don't have to be publicizing everything they do. And they don't care about being a minister, a pastor, an elder, or this or that. They don't care about the title. They're just doing the work, and God is using them to have impact, and God is pushing back darkness. Can I have an amen through them? And they're not tripping off it. And that's the kind of church that we're going to be. we just that old mule that just keeps on going. Can I have an amen? Come on, everybody, stand to your feet. Father, we just thank you this morning, and we praise you that you 
are building an army. Young people, old people, blacks, whites, Hispanics, Chinese, Vietnamese, Filipinos, people of all creeds and colors. You are forging an army and you are raising up a people for your namesake. We thank you that, Lord, these people are strong. They are courageous. They are valiant. They realize that it's not the picketing and it's not the rushing down here to City Hall and doing this and doing that. There's, there's, a, there's a place for these things, but it is a resisting the devil. It's a living a holy life. It's a living faithful and being faithful and consistent and honoring you and being strong and courageous to observe the things that you said in your word to do. And it takes courage to do it, Lord, when, when the world is telling us to go in a different direction, but yet we stick to your word. We want to be a church that sticks to your word that does not relent that does not cave in to the pressure of the world to conform we want to be men of God that love our wives, loves our families, that if we're single, we stay holy and we live righteously and we honor and respect the temple of God. That if we're young people, we don't get consumed with Instagram and consumed with TikTok and consumed with what people are doing, consumed with what the world is doing. That as young people, that with our young people, when they go onto these college campuses, that they stand for righteousness. The pressure that the schools and the, the, the faculty and the, the students push and go in this direction, that we push our young people, push back against the pressure to conform to this world. That our older people, that they, they have the sense of validation. And they realize that they're pouring into the life of the next generation. And they don't crash the plane at the end. They land the plane. They don't crash the plane. That our older people help to teach the younger people. How to walk with you, Jesus. How to be healthy church members. And to stay focused and faithful and committed. And honor God through your service. That, Lord, our church just begins to move in the Spirit. That we take ground in the Spirit. And there were people even come into this region and they get off on airway. That, Lord, they start feeling the presence of God. Can I have an amen? When they drive by cattlemen, they start feeling the presence of God. And when they, when they get off and they make that right turn on the Nissan Drive, and they drive by this 24-hour fitness, they feel the presence of God. They feel God is around here. God is here. That, Lord, there's something different. Lord, prepare your army. We are your army, and we give you all the praise. Somebody say it, amen, 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 amen. This morning, I want to have an altar call right here, right now, in the presence of God. If, if you are experiencing in any way any kind of fear, fear of losing relationships if you stand for God, Fear of losing your job if you stand for God. If in any way the enemy is trying to affect you with fear, I want you to come to the altar right now. Fear in your physical body. 
Come to the altar right now. We want to pray with you and believe. I'm telling you, if you stand with Jesus, he will stand with you. Come on down and, and let us pray for you and believe God to move in your life. Come on down. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on down. Altar workers, let's find them and let's pray with them. Let's believe God with them that he is going to move in their life and bring forth a boldness that they need. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next week.